Lonely, I'm Mr. Lonely, don't have nobody to call my own. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, <laughs> we're going to talk about loneliness, and we're so very sorry. Mended Light. <laughs> Hello, folks. We want to talk about the epidemic of loneliness that has really been part of the human condition forever. And it seems like it's getting worse and more pronounced. So how do we address it? How do we face it and create connection and safety in our lives? First of all, why is it a problem? What did Mother Teresa say? <laughs> I was trying to set you up for a quote and I did it really bad, but Alicia will read a quote to us now. <laughs> okay, I wanna share this quote from Mother Teresa. And she says, the greatest disease in the West today is not tuberculosis or leprosy. It is being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. We can cure physical disease with medicine, but the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love. There are many in the world who are dying for a piece of bread, but there are many more dying for a little love. Mm. And I think that puts it so, so powerfully and speaks so, so deeply. I think we all know what it feels like to be hungry, yeah. even if that's not something we struggle with on a daily basis. But comparing that emotional hunger and emptiness to the to food, like brings it so much more strongly. Yeah. Because how often do we feel that emptiness, that loneliness, and that despair, and just wish that we had the love and the kindness yeah. to fill that with? Well, and it's a legitimate human need, yeah. psychologically, emotionally, but not just in our minds and hearts. It affects our physical wellness and well-being if we're connected versus not. There's been plenty of research that backs this up, mm -hmm. uh, the numerous health benefits of connection and community and how the immune system is compromised by loneliness and despair. Yeah, the immune system, the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, mm -hmm. like basically all of it. And I feel like... 2020 during COVID was just a microcosm. It was it was an exaggerated version of what we were already doing, which is that we stopped getting to know our neighbors. We connected kind of with people online, but and I love connecting with people online. Don't get me, don't get me wrong, but there's a distance there compared to being in person. There's a physical distance. Yeah, and we just kind of get into our own little worlds, and it affected everyone on on a major level. The the inability to get out to socialize to do things on the level mm -hmm. that we want to. Loneliness contributed to spikes in depression, spikes in anxiety, mm -hmm. spikes in thoughts of self-harm, thoughts of ending things, thoughts of just not wanting to live. You, you, know how, <laughs> you know how in high school you go for the summer and then you come back and three months would pass and you'd take a week to kind of get back into the groove with different friendships and connections? It was that but for a year or for a couple years mm -hmm. and you fall out of touch with people and sometimes you never reconnect. And since then I feel like we've been getting the ball rolling a little bit but we're still struggling. And there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. And there's a difference between isolation and taking time for yourself. You love you time. I do. It is, but there's a major difference between that and not being connected. Well, and for me, who the way I've always shown up in my life is I get to a state of overwhelm. And if I'm interacting with people, it's because quite often they're asking me for something or to do something. And when I'm already maxed out, yeah. then the best solution is in my, the best immediate solution in my mind is just to be alone. Yeah. To that end, I think if the disease is loneliness, then the cure is connection and community. But the real question is how do we create connection and community in today's world? Yeah. And I think the follow-up question is how do we create that both in person and virtually? Because yeah. there are needs and benefits to both. Sure. Uh, and, and both types of environments can be supportive, just like both types of environments can be not supportive. I think it comes down to three things. First, it has to be safe, right? When we're creating connection, it has to be safe to connect. Okay, so create safety. Yeah. And from there, we can create healthy connections and relationships. Mm. And then a great way to do that is to look for opportunities to serve. Okay. 
Well, safety is a major concern for a lot of people watching this because we are a trauma focused channel. A lot of people don't feel safe. So how do we how do we do that? I think we start with being a safe person and doing this when you're healing from your own wounds. It takes awareness of what your needs are and how to meet those needs in a healthy way. So a good place to start for that, by the way, is our personalities course on our membership site. We'll help you get to know yourself better and what it is that you need so that you can meet those needs in a healthy way. And that personality course is actually, at the time of this recording, free for the time being. Hot so dang, jump on that. <laughs> Sign me up. And the challenge is to being a safe person and knowing what your needs are and meeting those in a healthy way mm. is the fact that we all have wounds. Yeah. We all have triggers. And when you're trying to create safety for yourself and be that safe person, like those things are going to absolutely pop up. When you say it, it's going to mm. come up, the fact is hurt people hurt people. And the reason they do that is because they're trying to feel safe themselves. I mean, they're trying to take measures to feel safe themselves. And as long as you feel like a victim, you feel unsafe and you're more likely to lash out or withdraw without even realizing that's what you're doing. You can experience being victimized and not live as a victim. Mm. Because if, you've, if you have experienced trauma or abuse because of the misuse of someone else's agency in that situ situation yeah. where you had no power to change anything, no power to control it, you didn't create the situation, that is absolutely being victimized yes. like you are a victim world war ii is a great example mm -hmm. of tens of millions of people who were victimized yes. right and then whether or not they chose to live as a victim after that was a choice and i'm not saying it's an easy choice i'm not saying it's a choice you make once and you and then you're just done i'm saying it's a real human condition that we all face to some extent or the other and there's a beautiful book on that called the choice by mm -hmm. Dr. Edith Eager, that if you feel called to it, highly recommend. The thing about victimhood is you find yourself waiting for the other person to fix it. After all, they're the ones who ruined your life or they're the ones that hurt you. Mm -hmm. And so it should be their responsibility to make it right. And honestly, that's true because everyone ought to be accountable for themselves. Problem is a lot of people aren't. And if you're waiting for them to fix it, it may never happen. That you have the opportunity to work through it, that you have the opportunity to grow and to heal so that your pain doesn't cause you to create pain for other people. And that means you create your own safe space and you become a safe person yourself by recognizing the behaviors in others that you don't want to emulate and doing the opposite. And that requires you to recognize what your triggers are yeah. and how to manage them. There's so much more to say about all of this than what can be said in a 10 minute YouTube video. Yeah. Um, and we have a program called Innate Healing that walks you step by step through the principles that help you grow through yeah. those traumas and those triggers. But the reality is, is when we experience, um, whether it's trauma or abuse or just someone acting in an unkind or unloving way, right? And if we internalize that behavior and we see that behavior as a reflection on us, when in reality it's a reflection of that on them, we create incongruent or false beliefs. Yeah. So for example, if um, I'm a child and another child treats me poorly and bullies me, depending on my, my personality or my nature or the type of home I grew up in, I might internalize that bullying and say, well, something's wrong with me. If yeah. I was a better person, if I was different, if I was just this, 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 then that person wouldn't treat me poor poorly. When in reality, that child acting like a bully has nothing to do with you and everything to do with who that child is. Right. And and all of our life experiences could be compared to that that child situation of of a bully and being picked on. We create unconscious, subconscious beliefs about what it says about us. And it's those wounds that we need to heal yeah. so that we can be our own safe place and we can be a safe person. And the more we're able to do that for ourselves, the more we're able to do that for others and we're, we're able to create uh, that place of safety. And Brene Brown says, shame dies when stories are told in safe places. Yeah. And so that is part of that healing journey. But sometimes we jump to wanting to tell our story and we do it with a person who is unsafe or we do it in an environment that is unsafe. And when I use that word unsafe, that doesn't mean that they're not 
good people or it doesn't mean that they're bad people. It just means that they don't have the tools or the emotional maturity yeah. to meet you there. That can be hard, but it's okay. Well, and that also means that some people who weren't safe previously have done the work to be safe now. Uh, and this is a perfect segue into our second point, which is yeah. creating healthy connections and relationships. And I want to clarify these three things are not one after the other. You do the work on yourself and you don't need to wait until you're complete and finished before you start having relationships or before you start serving. It all it, it's circular growth. Yeah. It's circular they all feed into each other. growth. Mm -hmm. And so you'll you'll work on safety and then you'll work on uh, connection and relationships. And then you'll come back and you'll work on safety. Yeah. And you'll have experiences where you're like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to create safety. Or, oh, this is an opportunity for me to create connection. Or this is an opportunity to realize that there's not enough safety in this relationship to have the type of connection that I would like to have. Yeah. That is the choice that quite often the other person is making. And even though it makes me sad, I'm going to respect that that's yeah. the choice that they made. And I'm not going to put myself in an emotionally unsafe position. So what this looks like, these relationships are not dependent or codependent. Mm -hmm. They are independent and interdependent. And, and it's a, not a relationship where you're trying to find somebody to fix you or for you to fix them. Relationships aren't rescue operations, right? We, we're there for each other, but this is why we have counselors. If you need... If you need fixing, if, if you need someone to help you work through serious things and you turn to a friend who doesn't have that skill set, they may love you, but they, it, it's like if I get my leg knocked off in a car accident, my family can love me, but what I really need is a paramedic and a surgeon, right? So, so lean into the professional resources. Establish trust, respect, and boundaries. And when it comes to families of origin, we often get into the mental trap of, of thinking, well, they're the problem, they need to change. And I'm not saying they may not have things to work on or they're not a major component or the main component of what's going awry, but you can't control that. You can control your inner response, your outer response, and what boundaries you set for how you will and won't be treated and how you will and won't respond. And that's it. Well, and we don't set boundaries to dictate another person's behavior. We set boundaries to create safety for ourselves. Right. And so there's a good chance you might set a boundary and friend or family member or loved one will not like it. Yeah. Right? And and then you're like, well, I'm setting a boundary. It's supposed to help things get better. And it's like, well, it will help create more safety for you. Yeah. But they may or may not like it and you cannot be responsible for mm -hmm. their response. And it may mean that you cut ties with some people or you spend less time with some people and you expand your crowd to bring in people who are safe, have a healthy and safe support network. And when I say that, a lot of people say, but how? How do I bring people into my life? And the best way that we know of is to look for opportunities to serve, look for ways to help. There's an app that we love called Just Serve. Dot org. Just Serve org, where you can type in your zip code and they have volunteer opportunities in your community of things that you can do just to help. It is really, really cool. Yeah, well, and I'd like to expand maybe the, the definition of service, right? Because service can be anything from smiling at a person at, at the grocery store to holding open a door mm -hmm. to, you know, seeing a lost child at the park who's looking for their mom. Like, like I don't know, right? Like, it's just being a kind person that sees other people yeah. and treats them in a, in a loving way. And you can do that in big ways, you can do that in small ways. Um, you can tell someone you love their coat, their hair, that's a beautiful piece of jewelry, yeah. you love their smile. Like you don't need to go and sign up to serve meals at a, a homeless kitchen or a shelter. That's a wonderful thing to do also. Right, um, but it's the small things. It doesn't have to be big things. Right. And you can do those opportunities with the people you're trying to build relationship and connections with, yeah. even if they're not really wanting to do that. Short story, for example, my teenage son, he went to go live with his dad. And so our dynamics changed and the amount of time we had together changed. But I still wanted to keep connection there, especially between a mom and a son, teenage years. That can be challenging, not yeah. living in the same house. And so we had plenty of things we would go do for fun, like go to a smash room or lots of, or play paintball or laser tag or lots of random totally boy things, which I love to do those things. Um, but it was creating an imbalance. And so I used that website. I went on Just Serve and I saw that there was a men's homeless shelter that we could sign up and go serve meals at. 
Um, and so that's what we would do. We would alternate between doing something fun and going serving m meals. Because something teenagers also need is to think outside themselves. Like mm -hmm. sometimes the challenge is they're too self-involved, like a toddler. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so you can create connection even by being in the same place, even if you're not talking. Yeah. Um, and, and asking those questions, asking those questions of yourself, asking those questions of the people you care about and saying, hey, I love you, I wanna support you, I wanna be connected, how do we do that? And if they grunt at you, like my teenager <laughs> did, then you just sign them up to serve meals and inevitably, even if they don't talk to you, they come away happier two hours later than they were to begin with. Yeah. Loneliness is an epidemic. Loneliness is a common human struggle. The good news is, as we've just explored, you don't have to wait for companionship or for safety to just happen. You can create it yourself. And in doing so, you can combat anxiety, you can combat depression, and you can combat that emptiness through connection and through purpose and meaning. What helps you to work through your loneliness? Let us know in the comments below. Do you have any suggestions that we missed? Any things that you think this is really the ticket that I want to share with the community? Please let us know. If you found this video to be helpful, we invite you to check out It Takes a Community to Heal from Trauma. Link is in the description below. And as Alicia mentioned, our personalities video course is free for you to try out right now. Click the link below to do that. Until next time, folks, keep shining. We need your light.